Okay. Well. Um, okay. I guess I should remind you to do the the yeah. evaluations for this course or whatever they call it now. Sets. <laughs> um, and are, are there questions about the final paper or anything before I me with Leibniz? Okay, Leibniz. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there are some things I didn't get a chance to talk about last time that are. Uh, pretty important to go into just to explain the reading for this time. So I'm going to go through that quickly, I hope, which is, you know, I never talked about, last time I never talked about how the monads interact with each other. I think maybe it was kind of implicit in what I was saying, but I never really explained it. So, and again, you know, on the one hand, you can explain it in the, according to the common sense view, and then on the other hand, you can explain it in all metaphysical strictness, right? So again, the common sense view is that there's monads up here in the intelligible world, and then there's bodies down here in the sensible world. Um, whereas in all metaphysical strictness, according to Leibniz, uh, there are no bodies. Or anyway, as I said it last time more carefully, there are no corporeal substances. Oops. Oh, All right. Sorry. <laughs> Everything okay. Yeah. Right. So in this picture, there's just monads, and this direction is time. So I draw them like this. All right. So um So first of all, like, where is a monad? I think I did talk about this. Well, I don't know. I'll say it anyway. Like, you might think monads are really, really small. Because they're simple substances, and everything else is composed out of them. And so you might think they're tiny, and you can't see them. But actually, um, that's the same mistake that Thomas points out when people think that the place of an angel must be a point because the angel is indivisible. That's not right because the angel isn't in place the way a body is at all. It's not in, it's, it's not in a place by having parts in different parts of the place. It's in a place by exerting part of its power in different parts of the place. So, right, so remember Thomas said, like, when the angel is destroying Sodom, the angel's place is really big. <laughs> right. So, similarly, a monad, like, so if this is me, where is the monad? Well, it's where my body is. It's everywhere where my body is. Now, like, I mean, so it's, it's, this is almost like Thomas, except it's, well, a couple things that even in this picture are already different, right? One is that, that this isn't actually causation, right? It's a pre established harmony. Um, so when I say this mon my monad is exerting its power in this body, um, it means this is the body that's particularly fit to represent this monad. And it's the body that this monad is particularly fit to represent. Right? So it's Kind of like in Spinoza, where my mind is the idea of my body. <laughs> um, and um, that's why my body does the same things, you know, acts in parallel to my mind, because 
my my mind is is suited to represent my body and according to Leibniz, vice versa. That part isn't really in Spinoza's mind. Um, but um, but it's also different from Spinoza and from um, Thomas Aquinas because it's not really true that the monads, well, I mean, I guess it depends how you look at it. I guess as long as we're in this picture, you can still say, so how does this monad perceive other bodies? And how does it exert its power on other bodies? And the answer is, well, because this body is affected by all other bodies and affects all other bodies. Right? So that is still kind of the same answer as, that we saw in Spinoza. Right? So, you know, Leibniz says, since the world is a plenum, right, it's full of bodies everywhere. Every time this one moves, all the other bodies in the universe have to move, at least a little bit. <laughs> So, um, so this monad actually exerts power everywhere in the universe. And similarly, anytime any body, any other body in the universe moves, it's going to affect this one at least a little bit. Um, and therefore, it's going to be represented here at least a little bit. And so this monad also ended up, ends up representing all bodies in the universe. I mean, you might say, how come I'm not aware of perceiving all bodies of the universe? And the answer is that um, these tiny perceptions are like not strong enough to rise to the level of my consciousness. So I'm having them, but I don't, I'm not distinctly conscious of them. They're confused with many other tiny perceptions. Um, so that's something Spinoza sort of says, uh, but I think, um, uh, and for Spinoza, that you know, a, an idea is confused, the idea in itself is never confused. It's, conf it's confused in my mind because of all the other ideas I don't have. Um, and it's an idea certainly never unconscious according to Spinoza or Descartes, right? So Leibniz is the one who's introducing unconscious, unremembered ideas. And some monads only have those, right? Like the monads that are the souls of plants and, and perhaps even more rudimentary types of bodies. Uh, but, you know, uh, I have, animals have some that are, that they remember and rational beings like me have some that they're conscious of and, and know that they're happy. Um, and others that they're not conscious of and they not know that they're having. And so the ideas that I am conscious of can be confused because even though I do have all the infinite other ideas you would need to make sense of them, I'm not conscious of them. So again, like turning it back, like the way it looks in this picture, again, is that, you know, so what happens is there's all of these bodies all over the universe. Like here's the wall of the room, you know, um, like, very few little tiny changes are coming through this wall and they're making very small changes in my body. And I'm not conscious of them, but they do all somehow add up to the perceptions I'm conscious of having. Yeah, did you have a question? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, so I guess I was kind of wondering with the like the big pond analogy uh, you gave last class. Yeah. Or like each, if you just look close enough, each like, you know, fish has like like a bunch of little fishes inside it. Yes, and, and the water in between them has little fishes. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> uh, so with 
with the way like monads work, if each of those little like like individual I don't know like monads within monads kind of like does something or affects other monads, are they affecting the monads within? I'm getting the metaphors kind of mixed up here, but are they only are the fishes only affecting the fish within the pond, or no, are they, they affecting it within like all of the pond? Yeah, every every body. So Ray Leibniz says, and, and, he, and he gets this point in the monadology, and again, like I said, as I said, even in the monadology, he's usually using this picture, not the strict picture, right? So he gets to a place in the monadology, he says, you know. The, the universe is body of bodies is analogous to the universe of minds because just as every mind perceives every other, no matter how faintly, every body reflects the motion of every other body, at least a little bit, right? So yeah, there's no like I mean, you could think of the wall of this room as the edge of the pond, right? Like we're in this pond. So you know, certainly using the sense of sight, I'm not conscious of any distinct perceptions from, from outside this room, but they're still there according to what. First, we can, you know, we hear things that are outside the room, but but that also only goes so far. Um, um, but, you know, um, it can't be an absolute barrier because um, because if things are moving here, something has to move to let them, you know, there's no extra space. <laughs> I, Connie, you're looking skeptical about that maybe. Yeah, like I'm not <laughs> sure, maybe you can work this out so that there is an absolute barrier and that, you know, like this one's not moving. Right? But that's that's line that says, you know, and at least it makes a certain amount of sense. Every everything is full, all the bodies are knocking against each other. So when any one of them moves, all the others move, it's the world. Yeah. So if there's no like if there's no small fish pond or whatever, then um is there also like no largest fish pond? And because of that, we're like by our movements and everything, we're affecting a bunch of like other fish. Like that are like strange than that. Yeah, like as, as I said, like Leibniz doesn't um, talk about this a lot at all, but presumably somewhere there's a bigger animal that like we're inside. It has to be pretty big, I guess, because like when you look up in the sky, I mean, I don't, unless maybe you think, I mean, some people think of the earth as being like a, an organism, I mean, the, um, the solar system, yeah, maybe he thinks that, I don't know, but um, in any case, it doesn't, like, there's, there's like infinite, I, I think he believes that the, the universe is infinite in space. Again, he does not say that usually that's considered problematic for various reasons but it's a theological reasons or whatever but yeah sorry i keep like asking questions you just don't ask me <laughs> like uh uh i i was kind of thinking of like my friend was just describing to me how like earth is he's learning about earth as a chemical system you know and so i guess like in that way if i could see like this kind of theory lining up with the fact that like we're a part, we're just like a smaller animal and a larger, larger animal. Yeah. The solar system, the solar system universe, and so on. I don't think that's his intention, but like there's some parallels. I'm not sure it's not his intention. Um, I mean, like a person, he doesn't know about, you know, current day geochemistry, right? Like, uh, but, uh, but, um, but you might well think that the Earth is a kind of organism. But, um, but again, I don't know anywhere where he says that. I mean, he he wrote like loads and loads of things I never read. So may, maybe he does say it somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I know like Hegel says that. Right. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, he might think that. All right. Um, 
Um, okay, but now if we, wait, was there anything else I wanted to say before I go over to the other side? No, I don't think so. So I'm going to go over to the other side. So from this point of view, what's happening? <laughs> Well, so like these these monads are not they're not ordered in space, right? Remember, space is an order that's like somehow created within the monad as a as the way it perceives all the other monads. So whatever order there is to these monads is, is like prior to the spatial order. The spatial order you have to be able to derive from the actual metaphysical order of the monads, not vice versa. Um, so, um, so what does it mean that like this monad has a body? And that it's closer, that maybe it includes the, the body of this monad, or maybe it's closer to the body of this monad than it is to the body of this monad, um, that it's that it acts on this monad. What do all those things mean? So basically, it, it all has to do with clarity and distinctness of perception. Like this, this is what I promised. Remember, when we got to Spinoza, and Spinoza proved that, um, insofar as we're active, we have clear and distinct ideas, and insofar as we're passive, we have fragmentary and confused ideas. And I said, when we get to Leibniz, that's going to be the definition of active and passive, right? Like, it can't be the definition in Spinoza because. First of all, in Spinoza, like thought is is only one attribute, right? That when bodies act on each other, according to Spinoza, they don't have ideas, right? So um, it can't be the definition in Spinoza, but it turns out to be the definition in Leibniz. Um, um, and it's not just a trick um, because it works something like this. Um, well, this, this one A and this one B. So when this one is acting on B, of course, there's no direct causal connection. It all goes through God and pre-established harmony. But you can still say that A is acting on B to the extent that God, and in the respect in which God made B the way it is because of A's perception. Right? It's like, um, so the, it's not a, um, Uh, there's kind of like a, a reason, like a ground and consequence relation, even though there isn't a cause effect relation. It's like A can, can like justly demand of God that God make B in a certain way. Now, I mean, again, like from some point of view, that's symmetrical and it holds between all the monads, but uh, Leibniz says the time when we say this one is acting is when A like perceives more clearly and distinctly what B is going to do than B does. Right? So that so that's the sense in which B is doing what it does because of A's perception. We, like A has a clear perception of what B is going to do next. And because, and that's why B has to do that next. And that's what we call A acting on B. 
So when we say over here, there's a body where this monad is exerting its um, power, and therefore it's virtually present here. What that means on this side is that there's monads that in a certain respect are all being represented uh, clearly and distinctly by A and not vice versa. Right, so like A is A's body is, or A is acting on them, and therefore A's body is like composed of their bodies. Now, I mean, it's only in some respects, right? Like it's not gonna, and um, which is, I don't know that Leibniz anywhere works out the complete details of how, like how you're supposed to explain all the different things we need to explain here distance, inclusion, size, power, yeah. So I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Yeah. Are you saying that um, one monad's perception of another monad sort of influences how that other monad is? Well, but it doesn't influence it by pushing, right? It, it influences it by like, that is what it is because I perceive it that way? Well, but only in the sense that, right, so like, and this is getting closer to the stuff we reading for this time. It's like there's no contradiction in only this monad existing. For example, yes. there's yeah. no contradiction. So God could have made the world contain only this monad, and all its perceptions would be false, right? Or it could have made God could have made the world contain this monad and this monad that is inconsistent with the perceptions of this monad, right? So that when this one perceives clearly and distinctly that this one is going to do something, this one doesn't do it. Something else happens, mm -hmm. right? But the the principle of the divine will, right? Like how, why, why does God do one thing that God can do rather than something else? That's really hard to answer, right? So, so like Descartes was left saying, the divine will is prior and we can't give reasons for it. Right? Um, Spinoza was left saying, God doesn't choose, God does everything possible. <laughs> Leibniz is saying, yes, there's a principle of the divine will, God does the best thing possible. Right? So, um, so like that world that has only this deceived monad in it is not as good as the world that has this. And uh, I mean, as as usual in life, it's, there's a lot of questions about what comes first, and you know, like what is supposed to be defined in terms of what, like what makes it what makes it better, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and. Uh, how do we know that exactly one word world is better than all the other worlds and there isn't a tie and so on and so forth. I, but um, I mean, it's the same thing Descartes said, right? There's only one best way of doing something and there's many wrong ways, but how do you prove that exactly? Um, so I don't know, but yeah, that's the idea. So so, so the, the sense in which B does what B does because A perceives it, is like there's no lot there's no logical necessity there and therefore from a rationalist point of view there's no causal necessity <laughs> you can't deduce what he does from what a perceives um at least that is not by the principle of contradiction but you can deduce what b does from what a perceives using the principle of sufficient reason that like you know god uh, has a reason to make B do what A perceives it is doing. Now, I mean, like when I say what A perceives it is doing, I mean, remember what the monads do is perceive, right? So like what B is going to do is is going to change its perceptions of A, for example, and everything else. Um, but so like in a way, B, A is doing what it's doing because B perceives it and B is doing what it's doing because A perceives it. But if A perceives more clearly and distinctly, then there's a special sense in which it's like due to, to um, what uh, A's state demands of the world that B is such as to conform to it, 
right? Because again, A has like a, a fuller explanation. In A's mind, there's a fuller explanation of what B is going to do than, than there is in B's mind. And so like in that sense, A is like pushing B. <laughs> but only in that sense. Um, um, and yeah, so somehow you're supposed to be able to get like the structure of space and bodies in space out of those ingredients. Right, like you're supposed to be able to define the distance between two bodies in terms of the the clarity and distinctness of their respective monads perceptions. Um, like, I mean, to some extent, you can see how this will work. Like, especially important as you can see why there's extension, right, and why. So remember, I was saying last time, extension. What's weird about it is that it's completely homogeneous. It has all these parts, but each part is the same as all the other parts, right? So now you can see why that is because like, so what space is, is the way monads perceive each other in abstraction from what they actually perceive. Um, and what is that? Well, so like if you take out all the details of what you perceive, all you have left is the fact that um, like what 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 the monad what's contributed by the fact that we're talking about a monad's perception rather than God's perception and is confusion. So extension basically is confusion. It's like it's, extension is like the smearing out. <laughs> and so and since uh, like all no finite mind perceives things perfectly clearly and distinctly, all finite minds perceive the universe as containing extended things. Right? So they, they all perceive this world of bodies. And since they're in harmony with each other, the worlds of bodies that they perceive, like at, it adds up to just different viewpoints on the same world of bodies. Um, whether you can get other things out of this, like, why is space three-dimensional? Um, why if two lines are orthogonal to the same line, will they never meet? Um, what's the difference between a monad perceiving a hand like this, and the monad perceiving a hand like this. <laughs> um, uh, like all those questions, these are these are things that Kant is going to point to, basically, in, in saying that we can't think of space as a necessary, like universal form. There's something that's particular to us about it that we can't account for. Um, and all those things are somehow related, right? Like, like the fact that in two dimensions, these are different. These are different shapes. Even though the relationships between the parts are all the same, right? You can see, like, imagine we were trying to get two-dimensional space out of monads. So you would, you know, um, it would be a hard. It would be hard to explain what the difference is between the the mutual relations of their clarity and distinctness that constitute this arrangement versus the ones that constitute this arrangement, right? Because the like these don't have like a this, that kind of asymmetry built into them, and yet here it is. But of course, if we add another dimension, then this one, then they're the same shape. <laughs> in three dimensions, these are the same shape because you can flip this one over onto this one. Um, and similarly, I guess you could say that if this weren't true, 
you know, you could kind of move this thing and move all of its parts in straight lines and they would eventually like cross and it would come out the other way. <laughs> so, but anyway, I shouldn't say any more about that. Oh, uh, I mean, it, it's suggestive. I know I have this big long math book in German, <laughs> which I haven't read. <laughs> Perhaps for obvious reasons, but I know uh, Bauchman, what's the guy's name, uh, shows how like you can develop the the Euclidean geometry and the two main flavors of non-Euclidean geometry, starting with axioms about reflections, like how many reflections it takes to get a rotation and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, um, okay. Is there anything? No, I'm going to move on to the new material then, unless there's more questions about this. Yes. I would just like Question. to clarify I'm getting about what you said. Did, or like the AZ comparison, did <laughs> the, did the perception, did A's perception of B like A monad, B monad happens yeah. when B changed, or like, is that just constant? Like A is always the key. Well, okay. So like in a way, uh, since the, 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 the current state of a monad consists in its perception of the current universe, but also the current state of the monad looked at in a different way is its appetite for all its future states. <laughs> um, so therefore, in a way, every monad is also always perceiving, you know, what all the other monads are going to do. In fact, there's this really funny passage in one of the letters in the reading for this week where, the, like, I guess Linus's correspondent was like, Hey, what do you think about these people who pretend who, who claim to be prophets? <laughs> right? There is some kind of like Protestant uh, sect rebelling against Louis the whatever Louis that was, mm -hmm. and uh, um, they they you know they they claim to to be prophets and whatever. And Leibniz is like, well, that's perfectly in line with my system, but he says uh, we have to judge by what's usual around here and. We don't see a lot of profits, so I would say chances are these people are not. You know, <laughs> but anyway, right? So, um, but it, nevertheless, it's this. I mean, you might think you could somehow define simultaneity using this, but Leibniz doesn't say that he's going to do that, and I'm not sure it would work. But anyway, like this is the time, so to speak, when it like explicitly represents what's happening at the same time in B. Like here it kind of works up to it as anticipation and here it kind of remembers it. So yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, I just don't know how the past works with that. It's just past. Well the 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 past, I mean it's also true the other way, right? The past has left its traces, right? I mean, precisely because this this past state was already like the appetite for everything that's happening now. Everything that's happening now is also like a record of what the monad wanted back then. Um, and therefore of what it perceived back then. Um, but like, again, so you have to remember, so every monad has a perception of everything and an appetite for everything it's going to do and preserves a record of everything it always did. But then somehow, and I think this is segueing into the material for today, I, I'm not sure I understand very well. It seems like there's three discrete steps and it's not just a matter of degree. Right, but there's like a difference between monads that just do this unconsciously and animal monads, and those are the ones that have memory, properly speaking. And I'm not sure exactly how, like, what that's 
it seems like it's supposed to be a qualitative difference in the type of states they have, but I'm not sure I understand what the difference is. Um, it's, I mean, it has something to do with clarity and distinctness, but it seems like, it, again, it seems like it's not just a matter of degree, but you pass a threshold and then it, then you, now you're dealing with an animal that's awake, with a monad that's awake. It's not in a stupor, stupor, how should I say? Stupor, I guess, right? The, like, um, right, uh, Leibniz says the, a lot of monads are in a stupor. It's as if they're sleeping. There's as if they're having a, like they're, they're in a deep dreamless sleep. Um, so they're still having perceptions and everything, but it's not, uh, they like they don't know anything going on. Whereas the, the animals are, are at another level, right? Like they're awake. They so and it's it's because they remember, right? So that like everything. I think like in order to have some clear perception of something, you always have to compare it to previous perception, right? Like you have to notice a change. So I I mean, I think I understand that, but, but again, I'm not sure I understand what makes memory specifically different. <laughs> um, and then, then there's this higher level where the monads are like not only awake, but they're, um, they, they understand something about what's happening. That's we're rational monads like us are supposed to be doing that. And because they under, they understand something about what's happening means like to a certain extent, they they know like why God made things the way he did. But they understand the necess to some extent, they understand the necessary constraints that follow from the principle of contradiction. Right, like arithmetic and geometric. Well, geometry has a somewhat weird status here, right? But, but there's, but I, again, like especially because it's hard to explain, you know, some particular theorems of geometry, right? But but there's something about geometry that's necessary, right? Like there. There couldn't be finite minds, according to Leibniz, there couldn't be finite minds that didn't perceive the universe as containing extended things. <laughs> yeah. So Leibniz has like ideas of like an unconscious and then some minds are conscious and then animals remember it. But how does that, I know Spinoza just says there's one type of mind for like everything or not, everything just has a mind, but does Spinoza ever distinguish between like the mind of a rock versus the mind of a person? Well, yeah, I mean, he did, he, remember, he distinguishes based on how complex their bodies are. Mm. So, like, the mind of a rock, so, I mean, it is a, it is a difference in clarity and distinctness or something, you know, because the mind of the rock only basically, uh, well, it doesn't, con it doesn't contain any ideas, it is an idea. Well, I mean, not, I guess I shouldn't say a rock. I mean, the mind of a simple body, if there is such a thing. I guess Spinoza thinks there is such a thing. He certainly talks as if there is. The mind of a simple body as opposed to a composite body. That's, I mean, like that's exactly where Leibniz, that's one of the places that Leibniz gets in, heads off the, Spin, the Spinoza's conclusions by saying that there is no such thing as a simple body. Um, and therefore bodies can't be substances, but minds can, and whatever. But anyway, but so according to Spinoza, if you have the mind of a simple body, so uh, um, that mind is a simple idea. I guess it does contain some ideas. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand. I mean, even the simplest mind, according to Spinoza, has like uh, 
an intuitive knowledge of the divine essence. Is that a remembering? That's not a no. What would make it a remembering? No, it's a it's it's right. That's um, those clear and distinct ideas. It, like or the adequate ideas that our minds contain, according to Spinoza, like in the end, it turns out that we don't really get them because they're part of our eternal essence. So like we always have them. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, but, so yeah, I'm not sure I understand exactly how the details work, but as you know, I mean, like, put it this way, this simple body doesn't have sense organs. So, like, the way other bodies affect it, they can only affect it by moving it. That's all they can do is change its state from motion to rest. They can't, like, affect its internal organization, and therefore, uh, the um, its sensations and imaginations will be very simple. So it doesn't know a lot about particular things. It's, it doesn't doesn't have a lot of knowledge of the first kind, as Spinoza calls it. It doesn't so it's like not aware of its surroundings. Um, presumably, that also somehow makes it hard for it to think and do geometry and stuff like that. But I'm not sure I understand that. But anyway, getting back to the getting back to the monads. So, um, um, right, so, um, so a rational monad, right, so now if A is a rational monad, like I said, the rational monad has a, um, As Leibniz puts it, it's not only an image of the world, but it's also an image of God. Now it's a very limited image of God, right? Like, but but oh, I I remember what I was in the middle of saying, right? So it knows something about the necessary constraints God is working under, right? That that uh, God can't cause contradictions to be true. Um, and it also knows something about the reasons God has for acting, right? That is, it knows something about which states are better and which states are worse. Um, so it doesn't just have an appetite for future states, but it knows something about the reason for the appetite. And that's the distinction that Leibniz makes between merely having an appetite and having a will. I mean, this is actually an ancient idea that, 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 that will equals rational appetite or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the monad sees reasons for acting. Um, but of course, there's infinitely much about God's reasons that the monad doesn't understand. Even though the monad the monad's nature represents all those reasons, right? Like they actually, the monad expresses all those reasons because the monad, just by doing what it does, is um playing its role in and representing the best possible world. <laughs> so, the, so the monad's nature is an expression of the best possible world and why it's the best. But, um, but the monad is conscious of very little of that, even a rational monad. Um, and I guess like, even if it's be much better than us, it's still, it's always going to be finite. So the, like the amount that it doesn't understand is always going to be infinite <laughs> compared to the amount that it does understand. Um, um, right, it's like, it's 
similar to the way these perceptions, you know, like no matter how acute your senses are or whatever, um, uh, this is why we, this is why extension is infinitely divisible, basically, right? That no matter how acute your senses are, um, there's still infinitely more detail that you can't perceive and it just gets smeared to, uh, to mixed than there is detail that you can perceive. So, so it like always looks to you like the universe is composed of homogeneous bodies, even though there's no true homogeneity anywhere. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so um, so the so so like based on this characterization of a rational monad, Leibniz is going to try to answer and that, that that's what's going on in this reading. All these questions about um, responsibility for action, um, freedom versus predestination. Um, and there's there's actually like two things under that. Um, let me write some of these things up here. Responsibility. Like, why does it make sense for this monad to get rewarded or punished? Um, also, how is freedom consistent? with predestination for um, and there's actually two separate issues here one is divine freedom and the other is human freedom or freedom of finite agents in general um Right, because remember, Spinoza denies both of those. Well, I mean, it, not exactly. Spinoza says that God and only God is absolutely free. But he says that God's will isn't free. <laughs> only God's power is free. Um, so... Uh, And another thing he wants to account for or explain the truth of is teleology, right? Like in what sense are do does everything in the world have a purpose? And in particular, in what sense is everything in the world made for us? Um And then also, I don't know if I'm going to get to discussing all of this, but he wants to deal with all these theological issues about grace, election, original sin. I guess you could also hear add here justification through faith versus justification through works. Um, and, you know, I mean, why does he want... So first of all, like he took care to try to have his writings approved by theologians, <laughs> right? I mean, Descartes sort of tried that, but I think it was kind of half-hearted. <laughs> Leibniz was much more, you know, uh, active about it, I think, and um, and successful to a large extent. Um, but. Um, uh, but it wasn't because, so like he spent almost all his life in Lutheran areas and working for Lutheran employers. Um, so like he didn't have to get his works approved by Catholic theologians for like reasons of personal security or something like that. But he wanted to, he tried to anyway. And I think the reason is that uh, 
among his many projects, he one of his projects was to try to bring about a reconciliation between Lutheranism and Catholicism. Oh, right. I mean, so you, I, I guess he didn't succeed with that, at least not yet. But <laughs> their relations are better, than, a lot better now than they were in the 16th century. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway. Um, he was trying to do that, and I mean, from everything we know about Leibniz and his personality and the, his views on interpretation and authority, like you can see how that would fit in, right? Like he he, he had a deep conviction that like both sides must there must be some truth in both sides, right? And that if that if they could only like figure out what each of their positions really meant, they would see that they actually were just two different perspectives on the same thing and they could like be reunited. Okay, so I mean, so I think that's a big reason why he's uh, trying to work out these like, puzzles, right? Because it's, these are among the things that the, the Calvinists and Lutherans and Catholics are like arguing with. Um, um, and he also wants to explain personal immortality or uh, explain how we can know that there is personal immortality. Now I say personal immortality, so like these monads can't cease to exist naturally they can be annihilated but they can't right that is god can could i mean he won't presumably this is another thing that i don't think why says and sometimes it sounds like he's saying the opposite but it's like should we think the world is eternal in both future and past time it seems like the best possible world would have to be eternal in future and past time, right? Like if you if you cut it off at some point, that would make it worse. Anyway, um, certainly in future times. So like it's not God isn't gonna actually annihilate any of these monads, but but nevertheless, they do, you know, he agrees with Descartes, they depend on God's conserva conservation at every instant in order to exist. So, like, if that's withdrawn, they would cease to exist. But they can't naturally cease to exist. And they can't naturally cease to exist. I mean, for the same reason, like Spinoza says, like, that, you know, whatever is destructive to this nature is not contained in it. So things can't be destroyed by their, by their own nature. But... I mean, Spinoza, that's, you know, it's still true that finite things get destroyed because they get destroyed by other finite things, right? Like something comes from outside their nature and clobbers them. But the monads don't, the monads, this is why I said at one point they're more like Spinoza's attributes, right? Like they have, in some sense, this monad is a completely different kind of thing from this monad and they can't act on each other. So, um, so this thing is just going to continue in its uh, uh, unfolding its own nature forever. So the monads are in that sense immortal, but that doesn't really, you know, I mean, this is the same point Locke makes at some point in the essay, although Leibniz takes it takes it in a different direction, but but. Like, it doesn't matter to me if there's some immaterial thing in me that's going to always continue to exist if it's not going to remember being me. <laughs> right? So, like, the question about personal immortality is, you know, will this monad always eventually uh, regain access to its previous states somehow? conscious access, right? So when it dies, 
So, like, first of all, when I, I erased the, the, the picture with bodies, right? But you know, when, so Spinoza says when a when a creature, what we call being born, is just getting bigger. And again, that's like inspired by by discoveries with the microscope. And some people actually claim that if you look inside a sperm, you'll see a little human figure inside. Okay. So that's not true, but uh, <laughs> um, and also like I, they didn't understand the mother's contribution, <laughs> to, right? So, but um, um, but so the idea was, yeah, there are these tiny light that says spermatic animals, right? They're microscopic. And so we don't usually notice them. And so when they get much bigger, all of a sudden, we think that this thing has come out of nowhere, but actually it was always there, it was just small. And then, so that's something that Leibniz wasn't the only one to say. But then he goes on to say this other thing, which is, and when this dies, all that happens is it gets smaller again. <laughs> it's still there. So, um, of course, over on this side, what that means is that, like, when the monad is born, it suddenly gets a, like, a much wider range of clear and distinct perception. And when it dies, it like, falls into a stupor. <laughs> and that's why its body gets smaller. Because other monads start to represent it better than it represents them. And so it, you know, so... Um, but again, personal immortality means that state is temporary. Eventually, it will wake up from the stupor. And then it will know. It will remember its past life. And we don't usually experience that happening. I guess it takes a long time to happen or something. I don't know. Yeah. But I kind of want to agree with what I played on the theory about the whole remembering things of past life, what, what learning is, I guess. Um, well, is that so, kind of tangential? well, it's not tangential, but remember when he says that, he says that Plato's view has to be purged of the error of pre-existence, right? By which he means that, I, I think, so, I mean, what that means, what that seems to me is, like, yeah, it's heretical within Christianity. Actually, lots of Jewish people believe in reincarnation, <laughs> but it's heretical within Christianity to believe in reincarnation, right? That like souls were like had a past life and now they're reborn, right? The soul is created for the first time when the person was born, and from now on it will exist, but right? So, but now we know actually that, that he doesn't think that, right? Like the soul did exist. If by the soul you mean the monad, right? But what he means is that there was a first time that this monad attained to sens sensibility and consciousness. So, so like it won't remember anything from before that. It's like affected by those things. It still has the traces of them, but before that, it wasn't a rational monad. Um, but from now on. <laughs> It will always come back eventually. It doesn't have a permanent return to this state. That's what he wants to prove. Um, I mean, it's really like it's a certain Platonists and Gnostics and Jews and other people in late antiquity. Is it actually, there's a weird thing in the Talmud about how there's like one bone in everyone's body that that like you know never decays and they they you know they, they can, like they, they keep being alive in that one little bone. <laughs> Which bone? Uh, <laughs> 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 but you know, but it's not. It's just like yeah, some of the Neoplatonists had views like that. That there's like an immortal body as well as well as an immortal soul, and it, you know, and Linus actually refers back to those people when he introduces this to show that it's not as. Ridiculous, I think, I guess, yeah. Is, is philosophy today still kind of use some idea of this, or is it mostly not really thought of? Because I guess the sperm thing would really work, but it seems like maybe you could say something like, you know, when I've gained 
clear and distinct perception and they somehow still exist like earlier and then later on they're not really dead do people still like or not at all well first of all i mean uh, there's there's so many people now there's there's nothing that someone doesn't <laughs> Just think about how many people there are. Uh, it, yeah, I'm sure there's someone somewhere who still thinks that Linus is right about everything, but uh, really? and perhaps even a professional philosopher somewhere, but that would be a little bit, I mean, you could do it, I, you know, but. I mean, with like a more like modern take on it, would that sort of like. Yeah, I don't know that that part in particular I mean, so like Leibniz had a huge effect on how people thought later. Like, you know, uh, as I think I was saying before class started, Kant and Schelling and Hegel and Husserl and, you know, so like, I mean, so for example, Husserl does believe something like this, but, you know, only in this type of picture, not in this type of picture, right? So like, that the stream of pure consciousness has, can't have a beginning or an end. So, uh, like, uh, it, there may have been, there may have been a time before which it was all like dark and confused and whatever. But uh, um, it's like belongs to the essential nature of uh, what Husserl calls an erlebnis, but you might as well call it an idea. <laughs> that it belongs to its essential nature that it always preceded by another one <laughs> and always followed by another one. Well, anyway, so, right, so there's there's someone in the 20th century, you know, still continuing the version of it. But I think it's not going to look exactly like this because we know too much about Bond's hand. I <laughs> think we do anyway. Yeah. Um, um, Oh, so what was I going to say? Okay, so like the first thing he works on, I don't know actually in what order, but the first thing I'm going to talk about what he works on is like how he deals with, with divine freedom. Um, so it's basically by that distinction between the principle of contradiction and the principle of sufficient reason. The principle of contradiction is the principle of the divine understanding or intellect. Um, and that determines what is possible. Right, so like, And so the correct order, and he says this, I think, most clearly in a monodology. I didn't write down a section number or anything, but right, he's in the monodology, he says there would be no reality in possibility if it weren't for the divine intellect. Right? That is just the fact that, that there's no contradiction in something happening doesn't constitute a, a power to make it happen. Um, so it doesn't, there's no real possibility. Real possibility means something exists according to which that thing could happen. And the thing that exists for everything possible is the divine intellect, right? So it's, it's because, I mean, it's complicated. It's not like, it's not supposed to be arbitrary at all. Again, the principle of the divine intellect is the principle of contradiction. And the principle of contradiction, any intellect can see clearly to be true. It's not like God decided to make it true. That's exactly the point. We're distinguishing between intellect and will here. So, you know, but nevertheless, it's because God knows everything conceivable to be possible, that that's why all those things are really possible. 
that is it's or that is it's due to the divine intellect plus the divine power. So it, he's really making a three-way distinction between power, intellect, or understanding. In French and English and German, words meaning understanding were used to translate the Latin word intellectus. So that's why you'll often find them to be equivalent. And will. I think, I guess this is also supposed to correspond to the Trinity somehow. I'm not sure exactly which way it works. Uh, anyway, so um, I didn't write down, but that's also presumably something he has to deal with. <laughs> the Holy Trinity? What? The Trinity? Yeah, like he has to explain. This this is like a traditional way of, of trying to understand that actually, isn't it? But so in any case, right? So the, the divine power plus the divine intellect is what makes things possible. And what the divine intellect supplies is the principle of contradiction. But um, what makes things actual, so to determine what's actual, you need the principle of sufficient reason. So like for, for a possible thing to be actual, there has to be a reason it's actual rather than some other possible thing. Um, and the principle of sufficient reason is the principle of the divine will. So this both this this both reinstates a distinction between possibility and actuality that Spinoza denied, right? And simultaneously, by the same token, introduces a distinction between divine intellect and divine will that Spinoza also de denied. And since, like, what's necessary, that is, the opposite of it is impossible, is what God knows to be impossible, that is, what violates the principle of contradiction. Um, whereas, what God does, what God makes actual, God makes actual because of the additional principle of sufficient reason. Um, God is necessitated to make this world actual. It was possible to make some other world actual. Again, just by like the way the distinction between possible and actual is being defined here. But it's, I mean, it's a reasonable way to define it, right? But it is saying, what's the, like, of course, there's a reason for everything. Nothing can happen without a reason. That's the principle of sufficient reason. But that doesn't mean everything is necessary. What makes it necessary is if the opposite is a contradiction. So all the other worlds that God could have created that are not inconsistent are, were all possible. God had the power to create them, and they were possible, so God could have created them. But of course, there's a reason God didn't create them. But that reason is, is the principle of the divine will. So right, like, I mean, God decided to make them actual because they're the best. So it's free, it's a, it's a free act in the sense that it's for a reason and not, so that is, it's neither by chance nor by necessity, but rather by choice. But it's not a free act in the sense that, um, we can't explain why this one happened rather than some other. I mean, the truth, again, like we've been seeing since, since Descartes, like part of the puzzle about freedom is precisely that um, if, if you quote unquote did something, but we couldn't explain why you did that rather than something else. I mean, that is, there was no explanation and why you did that rather than something else, then you wouldn't really be doing it. 
right? I mean, to do something, you have to be the explanation. <laughs> so, um, so that's what's going on here, right? Like, um, it's it's free because, as like as Descartes says, we're freest when reason shows us exactly what to do. And that's why we do it. So God is absolutely free, meaning both God has the, the power to do anything and God has the steadiness of will to and and the uh and the insight to always do exactly what there's a reason to do. That's the best reason to do. And I mean, so this way of talking is all anthropomorphic, meaning, right, like I'm just describing God as a human being and using um, masculine pronouns for, for to God and whatever. I mean, of, of course, like Leibniz agrees with Descartes and sort of with Spinoza, but with I, like with Descartes and almost everyone else that God is absolutely simple. There's no change in God, you know, whatever. So like, this is all, uh, there isn't actually a time when God reached a decision. Um, yeah. I don't know on the like, objective all-possible world like background. So I'm just wondering, does that like seem like there might be a limit to like God's reason? Because it seems like we could think of like a, even like slightly more better possible world in this one. But so then how does that work? Well, yeah, I guess I should have mentioned two possibilities when I said it's not clear how he proves that there is a best possible world. So, so there's two possible objections to that. One is that there's no best possible world because there's just an ascending series and the world could be, you know, as, as good as you want, there's always one better. That's actually, so that's why most Aristotelians are not optimists, right? Uh, that is in the technical sense, op, the optimism is the doctrine that this is the best of all possible worlds, like the optimum world, right? So most Aristotelians are not because they think the world is finite, right? Like here's the outermost sphere and that's the world and couldn't it be better if we were bigger? <laughs> I don't like that. Well, I mean, it would contain more perfection. Um, you're right. There is something weird about it. I mean, it's related. Well, because if it's perfect, how? why does it matter how big it is? Are bigger things more perfect? Well, they contain more reality and therefore more perfection. All no, of those things agree. being equal. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I mean, and you know, that's probably just the tip of the iceberg, right? I mean, that 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 just shows that like the world is 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 a the world is a finite finished thing, and it's you know you could always make it, you could always extend its perfection somehow. If if you don't accept this physical extension of perfection, perfection, there's going to be other dimensions. Okay. You know, so. Um, Right, so Leibniz has to say that um, um, well, so Leibniz says th this world actually contains an infinite amount of perfection just spread out, right? <laughs> um, or I don't know if you say it contains an infinite amount of I mean, yeah, I guess you could say it expresses infinite perfection. As, as best a finite thing could. So it, a finite thing can't express it perfectly because, uh, because again, like part of infinite perfection is simplicity. So, I mean, this, this, also, this is also the thought that goes back to Plato, right? That like, or at least to Platonism, that, you know, the, the more perfect you go in the hierarchy of being, the more unified it becomes. So even though at each lower level, in some sense, you have a complete image of what was above, 
it's always the, the, the very dispersal of it is an imperfection. Um, right. So, but I mean, so working with that, Leibniz is able to, you know, so like there is no best monad in this world, presumably. And there is no biggest moment if those are different. Um, no matter how good a monad you find, you can always find a better one. Um, again, like the ability to think this is probably related to Leibniz's mathematical work. Like the idea that you can have an or that you can have an order type where the, the things just keep getting better and better, and yet there's no limit. <laughs> um, so, um, anyway, uh, but, you know, like, I don't know how you can prove that's possible, partly because it's hard to understand what makes, what would make two different monads inconsistent with each other. I guess the point is, like, somehow, when it has to work by this, that when you add a monad, to this one, so you get more perfection because you now you have two. But if this one or this one is now is deceived, then you also lose perfection. So, right? So it's like the god is not a deceiver is is somehow a constraint that's going to make this. Right, like in other words, why not just make every possible monad the way Spinoza says? Wouldn't that be the best? But no, because they would, all those monads would be deceived about what the world is like. So that would actually be bad. So even though there's no such thing as positive evil, there's combinations of things that are, that are worse. <laughs> Than, than, than just one by itself. Yeah. Uh, so, um, for like, the, if he was creating all possible, like, monads, <laughs> would be that they would create more problems, the more of them they are. Yeah. I mean, the problem they would create is that, you know, like, so, so this monad perceives a particular world of monads. And, um, and that's the whole world that it perceives. Now, if you imagine also adding another monad that's not part of that world, that it doesn't perceive, that it's deceived about the world, because it, it, really, it thinks that the world doesn't contain this moment, but it does. <laughs> um, so that's why it would be worse. I, I want to get to, I want to get to at least, I don't, I won't be able to be able to discuss all these things, but I want to at least talk about human freedom and responsibility. Um, so, um, so what about human freedom? Well, I mean, the first thing he says about this in that dialogue, right, where this, like, I guess, kind of like politician guy. Which page is it on? This is on 112. Remember the dialogue on human freedom. Right, it says it's a dialogue with Baron. How do you pronounce that? The sense, counselor of state and war to Brandenburg. And the Baron is not all that bright, <laughs> right? Or anyway, maybe he's Baron is bright, but hasn't spent a lot of time thinking about like abstract topics because. He hasn't even heard about incommensurable magnitudes. Right? Leibniz has to explain that to him in detail. They also say here that they think this is a record of an actual conversation. I don't believe that. It might be based on an actual conversation, but it's obviously been like rewritten. To... This isn't, people don't actually talk this way. <laughs> All right, but anyway, um, so on page 112, the first thing he says, the right A is this Baron, what's his name, and B is Leibniz. So B says, 
It must be admitted, sir, that we are not completely free. Only God is completely free, since he alone is independent. So far, he's agreeing with Spinoza. Right? Absolute freedom would mean that you're not dependent on anything else, and therefore only God could be absolutely free. And he says, our freedom is limited in many ways. I am not free to fly like an eagle or to swim like a dolphin. <laughs> Right. So, like, if 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 what you want here is that humans, a human can do anything, well, no, we don't have that kind of freedom. All right. Now, I mean, obviously, that's not what we're asking for. Um, but he's trying to narrow down what we are asking for. <laughs> like, what is it we want here? Not to be able to do anything. <laughs> Now, on the other hand, and uh, this is from the letter to Coast, or I guess Cost, I don't know how that's pronounced, um, on human freedom. This is on page 195. He says, um, this is like towards the bottom of the page in the second to last paragraph. Moreover, I have also shown that when we take things in a certain metaphysical sense, we are always in a state of perfect spontaneity. Right? So it's not true that we have absolute freedom. You can see that in this picture from the fact that we can't make our bodies fly out the window or whatever. And you can see that in this picture it means that, uh, like, we never completely attain our appetite for clear and distinct perceptions or something like that, right? Uh, um, so uh, in that way, we're not free the way God is, but we do have spontaneity, right? So like, unlike Spinoza's modes, Um, everything we do comes from our own nature. By the way, you might ask, like, how did he get, so right, Spinoza and Leibniz agree that things of different, substances of different nature can't act on each other. But then Leibniz has this exception, except God can act. Now, by the principle of contradiction, God can't make it have a different nature than us. Right? That'd be like making a triangle that's not a triangle. But um, so like, that is God could create a different monad that does have a different nature and does something different, but can't change the nature of this one. But but the way God can act on it is by making it actual or making it not actual, that is by creating or annihilating. And how is that possible? Right? So, I mean, that's what God does. God cho chooses out of the realm of possibility of which one is going to be actual. So, um, and I think it's what, what the way the exception slips in, I don't have time to read the passage to you from the monodology, but that, that Leibniz brings eminent being back. Right? He says, all these perfections that exist in us exist eminently in God, right? So now, again, we have the idea that, in a sense, God has the same nature as every finite substance. Just like, remember I was saying how the sun, according to Thomas Aquinas, is like more of a mouse than a mouse is, and that's how it can, it can cause a mouse to exist. What yeah. page is that on? Uh, Sorry. So I wasn't gonna. Oh, I have to actually first. I have to find the monodology. Oh, you don't. It's okay. Uh, no, I found it, and um, um right after he first proves the existence of God. 
Where is that? Yeah, it's on page 218. And it's in section 38 of the monodology. That is why the ultimate reason of things must be in a necessary substance in which the diversity of changes is only eminent as in its source. This is what we call God. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Um, um, Okay, so so that spontaneity that a monad has, that it does everything by its own nature, gives it a kind of freedom that that like according to Spinoza, finite minds don't have. Right? It's like nothing has coerced it into doing what it's doing. Um, but uh, that still doesn't amount to freedom of will. Right? Like it's doing what it's doing because of its appetite. Um, so Leibniz next says, and this is back on page 112. Um, Um, so speaking rigorously, we never have perfect freedom of mind. So I guess, you know, so after he says that about the body, he says something similar to you said about the mind, right? So I'm not capable of reaching any possible decision any more than I'm capable of jumping out the window or flying out the window. I don't have perfect freedom of mind. Uh, but he says... That does not prevent us from having a certain degree of freedom that beasts do not have. That is, our faculty of reasoning and reasoning and choosing in accordance with how things appear to us. Um, or as he also says, this is back in the Discourse on Metaphysics on page 67. Um, Section 36. So, what did I want to read here? Oh, here we go. Um, so, after he talks about God being a mind, he says, God, insofar as he has a mind, is the originator of existences. Otherwise, if he lacked the will to choose the best. So again, like, so the rational monad, the fact that it that it is a mind, that it's rational, means that it can understand what it's doing. And that's what makes it have a will. So, be, so being a mind at, in being a mind equals having a will, right? Every mona has an appetite, but only the ones that are minds have a will because only they are able to under, like, understand reasons for doing things. Yeah, so he's right. So he says, so he says, uh, God, insofar as he's a mind, is the originator of existence. Otherwise, if he lacked the will to choose the best, there would be no reason for a possible thing to exist in preference to others. Right, again, so that's, again, is about divine freedom. But then he says farther down in the paragraph, um, thus the quality that God has of being a mind himself takes precedence over all the other considerations he can have towards creatures. Only minds are made in his image and are, as it were, of his race, or like children of his household, since they alone can serve him freely and act with knowledge in imitation of the divine nature. Right? So acting freely is acting with knowledge. 
with knowledge of reasons. Um, and so he also says, I'm not going to read this, but also in the Discourse of Metaphysics on page 64, he says that what is spontaneity in every monad becomes will in the rational monads. Right? So they, they all have this conatus, this striving to unfold their own nature. Um, but it, that, that conatus becomes willing when we go to rational monads that are able to understand reasons for doing things. So, skipping a lot of many, many details here. <laughs> um, we still have a question. How is it, and it has to do with this. So how is it possible for human beings to sin? How is it possible for us to do the wrong thing such that we deserve punishment? Because um, after all, what we do is always best. This is the best possible world. Um, so like it's it's not even the problem isn't even that we're determined to do that. Somehow. The problem is that we're rightly determined to do it. What is it we're being held responsible for? So I think the answer is um, I'll read what it says in the monodology section 90. I have to find the monodology again because I didn't write down a page number. What page did I tell you before? Um, 218. <laughs> okay. Yeah, here it is. I think after all this time, I would know where it is in the book, or at least have it marked. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, This is like midway through that section 90. This is what causes wise and virtuous persons to work for all that appears to be in conformity with the presumptive or antecedent divine will, and nevertheless to consent themselves with what God brings about by his secret, consequent, or decisive will. So these are like technical terms from theology, I guess, but I mean, but it's easy to understand what he means by them. Um, Remember, this monad has only a very finite understanding of God's reasons for act. So uh, to some very limited extent, we understand what would be best to, to do next. That's what's called the presumptive divine will, right? That is what, based on our reason, we conclude to be the divine will, because it seems to be the best. Thing. Then something actually happens. It might be different. From that. Well, now we know that uh, that was actually best, right? That's the secret or decisive divine will. We only know it after the fact that we see what happened. That obviously was the best. <laughs> so, how can this monad do something wrong? Well, the answer is that um, it, if it violates the presumptive divine will, then even though it actually does what's best, it's not doing what it thinks is best. So, and that's the, that's the locus of, of sin or moral error, right? That is, we always, in fact, do what's best. But um, 
but when we do what's best only because of our irrational inclinations and not because we see that it's best, that's when we've done something wrong. <laughs> it's it, it's weird, and I would like to talk about it more, but <laughs> the quarter is over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all, and. Uh, um, if you, you know, if you, so I will have office hour tomorrow. If you have questions after that, just send me an email or whatever. We can meet if need be. Are your office hours on Zoom tomorrow? Yeah, Zoom only. Yeah, I will not be in Santa Cruz tomorrow. Um, okay, see you. And uh, if not, I'll see you. I'll, I know I'll see a lot of you next quarter. So look forward to that. Okay.